Hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mākina kina ki uta, ki a mātaratara ki tai, ki a hia ki a nga te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Ko te tirangi te maunga, ko wai au te awa, ko ngai tamate rangi, ngā te hine wai atarua me ngā te whaitanga hapau, ko ngā te kahungunu ngā rauru me ngā te raukawa ngā iwi. Ko rangi āhua te marae, ko meri wai paupau te tipuna, he kaipu tahi ranga hau, a hau ko Kim Hamilton taku ingoa. Welcome and thanks for joining us this morning. I'd like to acknowledge the community groups and NGOs from throughout Aotearoa, also to those from um, government agencies who are joining us to look for insight to inform your work. I acknowledge those who are joining us from other countries around the world and we appreciate that this is a time of many challenges to community organisations and whānau. What Dr Edmund Fehoko and one of our board members, Annalise Robertson, have to present today is very relevant to how we can ensure that the community research that we undertake supports specific knowledge, practice and communities. Throughout the webinar, we invite you to log into the Community Research Facebook page <clears throat> to post any questions for Edmund and Annalise today. You can also use our chat function on the uh, Zoom link that you have. If you'd like to be notified when we're broadcasting our next webinar, please join our Facebook page and the Community Research Discussion Group. You can subscribe to our monthly e-news by emailing communications at communityresearch.org.nz. In our webinar today, we've got a chance to learn more about what we can do as community organisations and in our research and evaluation to support cultural and Indigenous practice in our work. Dr Edmund Fehoko, Pacifica Partnerships Consultant at Monaco Institute of Technology, will share how, to use, uh, how the use of cultural practice, such as fight cover, can be used to capture intergenerational experiences to support families and communities and inform policy. Edmund's contributed important research towards Tongan cultural identity and social issues in Aotearoa. The cultural practice of whaikawa includes aspects of socialising, sharing, talking, social bonding and fostering camaraderie and Edmund uses the whaikawa as the vehicle for his data collection. Uh, so our presenters, as I said before, Edmund's a proud Tongan from the islands of um, Kotsu and gosh, I do not know how to pronounce that word. Would you like to uh, say that for me, Edmund? Mungaone. Mungaone. Sorry, I should have checked that with you before. So Edmund holds a Bachelor degree in Criminology and Social Sciences, a Master in Arts with Honours and has recently, congratulations, completed his PhD thesis in Public Health at Auckland University of Technology and that had a focus on gambling and problem gambling amongst the Tongan community. Um, in 2013, Edmund was the recipient of the, Pacific, uh, the Prime Minister's Pacific Youth Award and most recently recognised at the 2019 Suntix Pacific People's Awards for services to Pacific education and research. Edmund is a member of the Institute of Directors and the Royal Society of New Zealand. He is also a board member of trustees for One Tree Hill College Christian World Services NCA Pacific Peoples Review Panel, Auckland Council Pacifica Peoples Advisory Panel and the Consumer Council for Counties Monaco Health and an active member of the Ponsonby Tongan Methodist Church. Wonder if you ever sleep, Edmund. Um, Annalise um, is one of our community research board members who is passionate about how we as community research can better serve and support Pacifica organisations and the research community. Annalise is a New Zealand-born Cook Islander with extensive background in adult literacy, community development and education. She's qualified in adult learning, not-for-profit management and governance and has contributed to the development of ACE policy and strategies in tertiary education, providing a voice for the sector both nationally and internationally. She's involved with a number of community organisations with a focus on capability building, infrastructure support, change leadership and succession planning. And this year, she continues to learn Cook Islands dance. I'd like to um, ask uh, Annalise to open our session today and lay down the wero for today. Kia ora, Annalise. Uh, kia ora, Nika. Malo lele, Ed. Uh, thank you for having me today on this webinar. I'm really passionate as a Kaitiaki member of community research and one of two Pacific people who sit in, in the board um, committee together. We were really challenged with trying to understand why, why we were there, why you have two Pacific people who were in the governance of community research. And that led to the broader challenge, I guess, about understanding where Pacific research sits, trying to give some visibility to it, but also 
wanting to build a repository, an independent place where Pacific researchers, evaluators and community can come together and share knowledge. So that was based on the premise that we really wanted to interrogate the space of where academic research sits, where community sits, and really giving some authenticity to the type of knowledge that is shared, that is collected through the process, but also understanding as Indigenous people. Um, you know, if I go back into our communities and I talk to our elders, are they authority of the knowledge that they hold? And how do we use community research as a platform to try and bring academic uh, research and evaluation together with, with the community? And looking at what I call the ancestrally qualified, so, and returning agency back to community voices so that they own the narrative and looking through a Pacific lens. So um, that's a challenge. And it's been wonderful working together with, with Edmund. We've had we've come off the back of two events, one held in Auckland and one held in Wellington, where we've started a conversation and tested the appetite from Pacific about whether or not they think this is something they would like to be a part of. And I think we had a good response to that. And we've started a conversation about bringing together a, a Pacific network um, and also looking at what, what kind of work is out there in the Pacific space and, and how we might build on that. So that's my challenge to us. Mm, kia ora, Annalise. Um, yeah, we'll come back to that and maybe drill down a little bit uh, later in the session, but I'd like to um, invite uh, Edmund to uh, share his whakaaro with us, with us today. So, malo e lele, Edmund, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kim and uh, Annalise. Tapu ki he tōta hai o toa, me āwhiwhio i ho taulotolo tonga. Tapu ki he kirekele ikin. Pea ku koriki u whamalumaru atu i ngai tala whatapu no kotoa pe, ku tala muka apui. Me he baha o pe, ka e a tāmo koe whainga maari koe ni ki whai pea ki tā lāwe, whilawe i pe, pea moe ka venga ko tuku atu ki whai ai hono tala noa. Ko ngō ko Edmond Whihoko pea ku ulele mai me he motu ahi taha i loa i hapai ko kotu maunga aone no muka ka maa mao whanga. Pea au ko olota ngā kaunga tāma ki i he apia ko te ki manukau. Ma uhoa ki he whanga ko whi whi holo to whomotu ka maa la paha. Um, thank you again, Community Research, Kim and your team, um, Annalise, um, and also I'd like to acknowledge Lingi, who's also on the board as well, uh, for the opportunity to, uh, this morning to kind of share um, something that's passion, um, that I'm passionate about um, and uh, revitalizing a sense of cultural practices and how we can weave that into uh, Western ways of carrying out research, but also into addressing social issues and everyday uh, problems that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, my name is Edmund Fihoko, and um, I'm not going to um, talk more about myself because it's not a Pacific thing. So I'm going to rely on I relied on someone else to do that, uh, do that for me. So thank you, Kim, for <laughs> for for reading out that very unnecessary long bio. Um, my let me start with my journey. My journey started at um, Graylin with my parents um, before um, making the move out to Central Auckland Maro School. Um, at the time, um, youth gang affiliation was on the rise, and my my dad, who decided to, um, with his factory job, buy a, a, a house out at West Auckland, and then we made a made the move to the mighty West, where I was grateful for. Um, being schooled at the School of Hard Knocks, Calston Boys High School, um, and then making the and then making the move into tertiary education. Um, later, meeting my wife, and then migrated to Otahu to reside with the rest of the Tongan population. Uh, and so, while I was growing up, um, I came across and I saw a lot of things, a lot, a lot of social issues that we that we still see today. But I also saw a cultural practice that could revitalize a sense of cultural identity in a very in a very Western and cosmopolitan society that we live in, known as the Fight Up. At the age of 14, I decided to um, participate in my in my very first Fight Up practice alongside my father, who was a, a heavy carver drinker at the time, um, also known as a carverholic. 
um, who's no longer a carbaholic anymore. He's just there to, um, you know, enjoy a, a good time with the, the gents. At the time when I first received my cup, I didn't, I didn't enjoy the drink. In, in fact, if you ask any kava drinker, they will tell you that the kava itself has a very bitter taste and it's not a good taste. And it's a taste that you just really want to chase away um, with something sweet. Um, however, when we, as the, the night progressed, um, I enjoyed the, the music and the singing uh, and, the, and the sharing of, of stories within the circle to a time, to a point where the taste was no, no longer an issue. For me, it was all about socializing with one another I and mean, enjoying a good time with uh, fellow countrymen. Um, later, when I hit tertiary education and pursued postgrad, um, I, I decided to look at this experience, this um, cultural practice and how it has impacted not just my life, but also other New Zealand born Tongan males. Uh, and with that, um, in 2013 uh, to 2014 as well, um, I went out to explore what was the experiences of New Zealand born Tongan males engaging in the Whaikawa practice. After interviewing 12 New Zealand born males, uh, some of the key findings of the study, and I wanted to keep this short because I, I, wanna, I want to answer questions and, and, and have more of a discussion really. Some of the key findings that came from my study was the concept of a cultural classroom. Now, we've seen in many Western education spaces where there's a lot of power relations between the teacher and student, where, for example, automatically when you enter a classroom and you have students sitting down and then you have a, a teacher standing up, there's already a power relation and eye contact. Whereas in the Nakava circles that I engaged in over the years, um, there was no power relation. In fact, um, when we all when we all came into the circle, whether we were sitting on the ground or on chairs, we were all eye to eye, and allowed for uh, for all power relations to be broken. The the practice of kava has allowed that to for all cultural and communication barriers to be broken as well. And what was very interesting was that. Um, uh, over the years where I've seen um, ministers, church ministers, um, political leaders, educated elites, wealthy people, high school dropouts, unemployed, all sit in the one circle and have a, have a communication discussion, discourse in a very leveled way. Um, and so, for example, I can take the mickey out of a church minister in the Kaaba circle in a way that I can't do at church. And, and, and what richness does that bring to the self-esteem uh, and the, the confidence of an individual when he has, the, when he has the, the, the freedom to do certain things like that? Uh, secondly, the uh, revitalized and reinforced the sense of cultural identity, mainly around language. Now, as a 14-year-old, my Tongan wasn't great, and I've got to admit that. And since entering the circle over the past years, I, myself, and many others, New Zealand-born Tongans, um, have increased the fluency in the Tongan language to a whole new level. We have seen Tong New Zealand-born Tongans' um, language fluency from a commoner's level to a noble's and to, to, some, to some extent to the king's language. And that's all through the richness and the, the learning from the Kaaba circle. So uh, for a lot of New Zealand-born Tongans, Participating in the Kava Circle has allowed us to increase our Tongan language fluency. At the same time, we were able to share our knowledge around English language and transfer that knowledge to our elders, where some of the elders who had some, some sort of broken English were able to speak English and, and take that and transfer that to with their respective workplaces and homes as well to improve their communication engagement with their families and colleagues. One of the key findings that in my study was that the, the importance of intergenerational harmony. Now, for a lot of New Zealand born Tongans, this is a fire alarm happening at the moment. Just bear with me here as we go. <laughs> Don't worry, Jesus is with us here. Um, 
Let it be. It's a Monday. I think I should just progress. Am I right, Kim? Um, I think you, you may need to leave the building. Health and safety first, Edmund. Oh, it stopped. Maybe they were testing. <laughs> just make sure they don't. Uh, yeah. This is the beauty of the fight cover, right? <laughs> you know, happen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just bear with, bear with me here. I'll, I'll I, I can ask Annalise some questions, actually, <laughs> if you like, while you're going and seeing what's going on and working out whether you're not and just text me, Edmund, um, about whether or not you're allowed in. <laughs> so, Annalise, there are a few things that have happened over the last couple of wānanga, and sorry to our viewers for that, but, you know, fire alarms are what they are, and um, health and safety first. And I think um, the last two uh, uh, talanoa that we've had in Wellington and Auckland have really focused around uh, ceremonial traditions like uh, kakala and kava, and, you know, I think one of the things that I've, I've taken away from that as somebody who is not familiar is about how these are things that actually unify a lot of our Pacifica peoples in Aotearoa, but also how there's what is seen at a, at a level, like you can see the kava bowl, mm. you can see the uh, kakala, but the, the deeper, deeper expressions of what that actually means and what it is a promise of. Can you talk and share a little bit more about those? Yeah, sure. Maitaki Kim, thank you. I, I guess for many of us who have been around long enough, and particularly for those of us in the education sector, you often see how our cultural knowledge, um, and I'm referring to Pacific, how it's adapted into a Western context, and not always in a very good way. So, um, for example, Kakala, which talks about the, you know, in, a, in the Tongan context, and Tongans would understand this in a very authentic way. We're not expecting the application of that for um, people who are not familiar with that type of knowledge to then go out and make a flower garland and present that to all their clients. That, that's, that's not, that's the danger, I guess, that we have when we're taking Indigenous knowledge that doesn't belong to a certain group of people and it's been applied and adapted um, and even interpreted in a way that's not authentic or not well intended. And, and that. That has been part of the discussion and some of the comments that were made when we had our um, gatherings in Auckland and Wellington is really looking at um, how we as Pacific people, if we're working in a space, if we have been given the honour and privilege of gathering knowledge, giving knowledge, applying knowledge, then there's a, there's a very high level of uh, guardianship that's required with that. And so for myself, I always say I'm not an academic. But at the same time, I challenge a Western framework that has colonized a system of knowledge for many, many years, of course, um, because I, I work in communities where I'm located. And so I often refer to our community leaders as being ancestrally qualified. So who has authority to qualify our mamas who are experts, or we call them taonga in tivai bai making. So they're not just making pretty things in arts and craft, which is not valued in, in that sense. But the um, you know, when we get into the knowledge system, the communal cultural practices that take place around making a tea bye bye, that can take months. Um, and, and it's not just for arts and crafts sake. So there is a real deep rooted ancestral lineage that's connected to a lot of the knowledge that in, in for Pacific, and that's just one example of um, why this space is really important for us. So I'm very grateful to Ed, to Dr. Edmund Fihoko, and congratulations, Ed, on your PhD that's been published in the weekend. Um, yes, that's right, uh, mathematics. So we've, we've got the Cook Islands um, researchers, their mother and daughter, Bobby and Hunter. I can't remember the daughter, I should remember. But both of them are, they have a PhD in mathematics. So they've used the TVIVI system as an example of how they work within schools with children to culturally contextualize mathematics so that it makes sense. Um, but the way that they do it, the way that they have applied the TVIVI methodology is really powerful. Um, and so you can see how the importance of maintaining the guardianship of that type of ancestral knowledge, how it's applied in a Western context as well, but also um, 
giving credit and agency back to where that knowledge has come from as well is really, really important. And it, you know, for for both the you know the indigenous um, respect, but also if we are applying it into a Western context because we're in Aotearoa, then that's really important for us to maintain. So I'm really looking forward to hearing um, Ed's carver circle. I'm imagining myself being in the Tongan church, sitting at a carver circle and being given the honour of being on the same level of the Whaitekau, as an example. Um, that, that's why I think these are really privileged spaces for us to be sharing this knowledge, because we're very precious about it. We don't share. You now in the Cook Islands, we we are very precious. It's the, knowledge, the knowledge is often reserved for the chosen. So if you're not allowed to sit at the feet of those elders or those ariki, those chiefs, you won't get that knowledge. But you know what we're doing here is we're blowing that space open and making knowledge more accessible, but trying to do that in a respectful and caring way that honors the indigeneity of, of that as well. And also trying to interrogate racism through that. You know, we're, we're with a, a returning government where, and in tertiary education, the new strategies just come out. So they're calling it un unconscious bias. It's racism and it's not new. So, you know, what is the place for Pacific research evaluators and knowledge gatherers and givers and makers and breakers and shakers? What is our place around dealing with that issue as well? Maybe they should go and sit down around the cover bowl with Edmund and chill out. It's <laughs> <laughs> the main thing. Anyway, back to you, Dr. Thanks, Edmund. <laughs> Sincere apologies, um, team and ladies and gentlemen tuning in from wherever you're tuning in from. Um, we had a fire alarm here. Don't worry, it's just that the weather here, um, some, some Samoan must have just... <laughs> Anyways, where was I? Now, going back to the, the, the Whaikawa, uh, I was referring to intergenerational harmony. Now, a lot of the, the um, social issues such as suicide has, has you know, pretty much on the rise for our young Pacific young people. And one of the main reasons, there was a 2017 study that found that communication, uh, the lack of communication with young people to elders was one of the key reasons why young people committed suicide from a Pacific perspective. And what we found was that we need to uh, look at cultural practices that had intergenerational spaces to bring young people and elderly together and provide a platform where communication could be in a very harmonious way. And what better way to do it for the Gava Circle? Now I'm gonna talk, talk very fast here. I want to catch up the time, but also for the, just in case, um, another fire alarm takes place here in, in, in Otara. Another key finding was uh, the Faigava space becoming a, an alternative, uh, a supplementary site for alcohol consumption, excessive alcohol consumption and youth gang affiliation. Almost half of my participants were affiliated to some sort of gang um, aff you know, affiliation around the South Auckland and the wider Auckland region really. Um, in fact, a couple had um, been affiliated to some gangs uh, in the United States, talking about the notorious uh, Tongan Crip gang um, in, in, in Utah. Uh, and so what, they, what he found was that because of the Faigaba, it allowed him to stay away from, the, from youth gang affiliation and have their sense of brotherhood, not in gangs, but in the Faigaba circle. And so there's uh, been talks about how do we weave in such practice into our, maybe if we're in a New Zealand context, looking at corrections, looking at youth work, looking at, um, at a juvie system here in New Zealand to help a young, help a young people, um, our Pacific boys move away from social issues um, and become more safe and secure in a cultural space and having all these values and ritual practices and beliefs take place as well. The, the future of the Faigaba is dependent on a number of things. Church plays a big part of this. Um, and, and also um, the, the role of Tongan kava drinkers today. Now we've seen a spike of the popularity of kava amongst non-Pacific peoples. And they've now come on board and almost taken over the market. And, and we've seen a, a rise in demand of kava in many countries such as um, Germany, Norway, Poland, 
and many other um, states in America as well, where they've seen value and richness in this um, cultural beverage and, and practice, and they can they can utilize and, uh, and, and use as a supplement back in their homelands. And, and as Pacific peoples, we need to be the guardians of such practice that's that's close to us. Uh, and and no, you know, if we look at New Zealand, for example, uh, we need to start looking at how we can preserve um, GABA in a very um, traditional way, working alongside Pacific peoples in the homelands and keeping them safe and aware uh, and raising the awareness around what's happening globally that could impact them um, and, uh, and the families and farmers back in the homeland. Now, in regards to data collection, I've, um, I've been able to utilize, uh, use the space of the Faigawa as a supplementary site to Western focus groups. And in my PhD study, um, it, was a, it was very rich and very um, long lasting data noise within the GABA circle talking about gambling and problem gambling. So there's a lot of richness in around these practices that we can use, but uh, you know, such like legend, the, you know, the infamous frameworks Pacific frameworks, the likes of Gonai Head of Diamonds, Kakala Framework, TVI, the Fafari Tui, the Fonofale, um, has laid the platform for other cultural practices to be looked at and be um, explored as possible research frameworks and methodologies for the up and coming emerging researchers um, today and also in the future. So um, there's a lot of work there um, around GABA that we can take place and, and use it in many spaces. Um, you know, the police have also looked at the GABA space, um, particularly with and how we can bridge the gap between um, young people in our communities. Uh, and what better way to do the fight GABA uh, is like, you know, for example, um, the, uh, if you want to engage with our Pacific communities in a very uh, respectful way, then I suggest that you look at the GABA circle as a means to bring people together. Um, I proposed a model that has been cited in the, in the PhD thesis by Dr. Daniel Hernandez from the University of Auckland, where I looked at the GABA bowl um, that's um, a framework on its own. According to Tongan, Tongan peoples, really, the traditional GABA bowl has four legs, four legs, right? For some weird reason, the Samoans have added extra legs for the extra stability of the cover bowl um, for some, I don't know, I'll leave that to the Samoans. Anyways, the, 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 in 1964, um, Queen Sanlo de Dubo III, the third monarch of Tonga, coined the concept called the Fai Gabe Gola. Four golden pillars that encapsulate what a Tongan individual should look like in a Tongan society. The importance of Farapa Apa, respect, humility, not a don, mama hi mea, willing heart to do things, and also tauhi vaha, maintaining or nurturing relationships. Each value is represented in the in a leg within the, the Kumetikawa. And if one leg is missing, automatically we all know that the Gaba becomes unstable. So too, a sense of cultural identity or Tongan identity in, in Western society. So my what, what I'm trying to say is that whatever goes into the, the Kumite Gava, doesn't matter what goes into it, but if the legs are strong, they still upholds our cultural values in a Western society that we belong to. Um, and if one leg is missing, then it is our role to strengthen that leg in order for the, the, the Kumite Gava or the, our cultural identity to stay intact. So it's a framework that, um, that I, some, I'm hoping someone will take it and run with it somehow, somewhere. Uh, and, but other than that, um, that's pretty much my, my coordinator for today. I'm so I've, I've got a couple of questions for you, Edmund. Um, one, well, one is, one is, yeah, one is, can you sit in a Fai Kava and not drink? Can you be part of Fai Kava and not drink? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, you know, for example, my father, um, who um, he doesn't drink anymore, but his role now is to go in and instigate, I don't know, instigate the discussions and storytelling and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you're not frowned upon. Uh, in fact, if you, if you, you just got to tell them, really, tell the car drinkers, uh, no, I'm good um, for some medical health reason. Yeah. Um, just make it up. 
Bill, Bill pretty much appreciates that. Similar to how, how English ladies will have tea parties, right? You don't want to drink tea, and therefore to engage in the Dalanor, engage in the discourse as well. So another question is, is it open to women? And then I've got another couple as well coming through. It's a very interesting um, question that I've been asked many times over the years. Um, personally, I'm, I'm open. Now, um, I've got to say this. There are five different Kaaba sessions that we know of that according to the late Professor Futahelu, where he coined the five different Kaaba sessions. One is the Faikawa Eva, courtship. Now, it's, it will, people see, may see this as traditional. It's, it's a recent introduction to Tongan culture where you have a young female single server serving the kava of a, of a group of males. But within that group of males is one male who's interested in the young, in the young girl. And so um, what better way to do it but around the kava bowl and allowing them the two interested people, the young female, the young male to talk. And then you have the group of males singing, serenading them with love songs um, throughout the night. Okay. Two is the um, Galapu Gabadonga, which you may see around here in South Auckland or around the Auckland region. Um, and if you see a, a, a house full of cars, um, guaranteed that's a Tongan house with a lot of kava drinkers in the garage. Um, Fun fact, there's roughly, there's over 20,000 kava drinkers here in New Zealand on a weekend basis. There's roughly about two, 300 kava clubs here in South Auckland alone. And then we're growing across the Auckland region and then growing across New Zealand. Um, you know, for example, um, the Tongan capital in New Zealand, maybe people may see as Odahu, but it's actually Omaru. Um, and hence why we call them the Tongaru. Um, and so, Thirdly is the Sunday Kava. The Sunday Kava where um, the, the minister or the, the, the lay preacher will have a cup of Kava before he goes to the pulpit and preach the word of God. Now on behalf of the congregation, on behalf of the land, he will go up and, and, and accept his Kava before he preaches. Four is the Taufukolo Kua, which is the, which is the practice that's slowly um, um, uh, finishing, I guess, or the, on the decline. Um, because of the, the impact of globalization in, in, Kava, uh, in Tonga. And there was a, there was a Kava session for fishermen and, and farmers in, in, uh, in the rural areas. And lastly, is the, as a practice, there's a Faigawa session that has just left my mind, but we'll come back later to it. Open to women. Now, open to women. Go back to the question. I'm open to women. However, I'm going to be up front here, and a lot of the carbon drinkers may will agree or disagree, is that there's a lot of, there's a, there's a misperception out there that carbon drinkers and carbon circles, all we do is flirtatious discussions. That's not the case. And I've got to be up front here. As, and hence why a lot of Tongan people may see the carbon circle as an inappropriate place for, for males and females. Now, that's an individual personal choice for, for, for uh, males to make that. Um, that's been, this, in fact, let's be honest, that has ruined the reputation of the Gava circles over the years um, because the um, this idea of flirtatious discussions taking place in the Gava circle. Not all Gava circles are like that. There are some people out there who do that, and I'm going to be honest. However, that's a personal choice of, of um, and, but, you know, slowly uh, miss. You know, there's a misperception out there of the cover circles being their space. And I've drunk with Tongan women. I've drunk, in fact, the Fijian women <laughs> that are the most heaviest cover drinkers I've drunk, drunk Kava with. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good, rich space where you can share knowledge and experiences from different genders as well. So there's another question here around ethical considerations, maybe of using well, using having Faikawa as a data collection method when people are potentially under the influence of Kava. So have you got a bit of Faikawa around that? The, the, let's, the, the Gava drink, right, is similar to any food or beverage. You have too much of it, you're under the influence, right? Now we've seen and we've, been a particip we've participated in a number of research where you've drunk so much coffee 
uh, so much tea, you've eaten so much food, and you're under the influence anyways. Kava is almost the same as well, right? Um, kava itself, um, you know, just in case I might get the question, is, is not an alcohol. Kava is not an alcohol. And um, in fact, there's research by uh, a Waikato scholar, a Fijian scholar who's looked at the influence of kava in a lot of uh, in driving assimilations. And what he's found is that there is no impact um, within kava drinkers uh, and those who don't drink kava. So um, the, the regards to ethics, um, you know, we're all under the influence somehow, some way. Um, and kava, when you drink, when you drink kava, you're the, it's a relaxant, but the mind is still critical. And the, the mind is still almost stronger than anyone else's mind not drinking kava. So, um, again, that's I think it's a, a a good good question that we can uh, propose to possibly write a paper with other scholars as well, and how we can address the ethical considerations of kava practice moving forward to the future. So, it, at one of the sessions, there was a discussion around, um, and this is kind of a little bit off topic here, but um, around the value of frameworks versus leading research with your values as Pacifica and um, how frameworks are sometimes very much Western constructs. And, you know, if we lead with our values, with those things we hold dear, and I guess that also talks about that. I was really interested in the concept of art and, and how that is about the relationship between us. So would you like to share a little, share some thoughts on that? Uh, yep, yeah. um, I guess, you know, with, and it's highlighted in the, um, the, the golden pillars that I mentioned earlier, and, and Annalise can feel free to chip in with the Akukana perspective on this as well. Um, you know, with the, we as Pacific people are all about values and we are more value-based and relationship-based than any other, um, I guess, background out there in regards to carrying our research. And, and so for from a town perspective, it's, it's critical to understand the values of our, our family or community before going in to carry out anything that you do, whether it's research or whether it's just informal meetings or engagement, um, you must understand the value. And, and as a person, um, you know, you get, you've got to understand your own values before understanding others as well. Annalise, did you have any, from a Cook Island perspective? Yeah, Malo Ed, uh, absolutely agree. I think the value system across Timuan and Nui Akiva is understood as universal practice. And, um, and particularly in the re research space, if, if you don't know, then just ask. Because often our, our value systems are not the same either. So we can't make assumptions on what, you know, for example, what respect looks like in the Cook Islands will look very different to in another Pacific nation. Um, but very much, I think across Te Moana Nui Akiba, the value system is very universal and, and it's the, the underpinning foundation upon which everything takes place as well. So if you get that right, then you should be okay. Um, one of the other things that people have been picking up on, oh, actually, sorry, there's another question related to Carver. Uh, one is the question, a question from Amanda asking if the uh, increase of use in, of Carver in Europe is uh, connected to the increased migration of Pacific peoples to those countries, perhaps, or whether they've come out to the Pacific Islands and just taken the practice home? Um, a bit of both. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, as Pacific peoples, we're now, tra we're now traveled really via, um, and, you know, for example, um, we have Tongan, Samoan, rugby, Fijian rugby players going over to the UK, going over to various areas in, in, in Europe. And so as Pacific peoples, wherever we travel to, we take our practice with us and, and our cultural values and Kava being one of them. Uh, in fact, the UK have a number of Kava clubs, um, well-established Tongan Kava clubs out there as well, and also the Fijian rugby players. And um, we have Fijian um, uh, people involved in, you know, the, in the army um, in, in, in the UK as well. So they've taken Kava into that space as well. At the same time, we've seen a number of um, people coming into the Pacific and to, because they've heard of this um, relaxants or they have heard of this um, narcotic um, and, and they've seen value in it. And, and so, for example, Germany over the years have taken the kava 
um, plants and, and, and beverage and used it into little um, uh, medicines or tablets um, to counteract some of um, some health issues that, that are taking place in Germany. Um, some health benefits for kava looks at insomnia, um, headaches, migraines, um, suicidal ideation, uh, and also menstrual problems as well, amongst many others. And so um, if you want further information regarding that, I suggest and strongly recommend that you read research on health benefits, particularly from um, um, Dr. Apu Aparosa from Waikato University, where he also looks at the mythalizing the kava aspect, now looking at you know, how people have all these questions, whether kava is a drug, kava is an alcohol, kava takes away farther away from, from the family, all that kind of stuff that's all um, highlighted in the paper by Dr. Uh, Dr. Aparosa. I think a follow-on to that, Edmund, and we've certainly experienced that as Māori in New Zealand has been uh, brands like Walida, who are German brands of, you know, remedies and things, uh, taking our in indigenous, you know, flora and fauna and, um, you know, providing, you know, basically patenting that knowledge and that use of it where there's very little benefit derived back to the indigenous nations from which those uh, practices and those... Um, those rongoa, those medicines have come from. So do you have a view on, on that? And in some ways I'm thinking this relates to Y262 as well, but. Yeah, and I guess that's the one, you know, one of my, the, the purpose of uh, this, this presentation, I guess, is how, and how we can look at various traditional and cultural ways of doing things, but weave it into some of the mainstream environments and spaces that we're currently in now. Um, and you know, if it's healthy medicine, we can use kava kava as part of that journey. Uh, and, and social engagement and community engagement, what do we use the kava circle as the means to, to engage with our people, carrying out research? Um, you know, and the Cook Islands will have their own ways of doing things as well through the, the delicious donuts and manas that Annalise can cook us one day. So one of the questions, uh, um, and I, yeah, I kind of feel like this is going down a down a particular road, which I'd like rather stick to the positive side. But one of the questions is, um, do you think we need services to help people who might be dealing with um, carboholic issues? That's um, that that's that's not a new issue. That in fact, that's a that's something that's uh, taken place over the years. That's that will require a family to come together to talk and address that issue. Now, I've seen a number of kava drinkers who have done too much. And let's be honest, we know of those who have drunk too much alcohol, who have done too much drugs, all that kind of stuff. At the same time, we need to address them in a very culturally appropriate way. Now, um, our services will need to do a big, play a big part in this in understanding the concept of kava anyways because we've seen, a, I've seen a number of services who have used, um, who, who have addressed kava, but from a European way. And um, it's one, it's already, they, they try to demonize kava, the kava practice uh, and, and blame it on the kava instead of looking at the individual itself. Now, and, and that's also, not just the individual perception, that's, a, that's almost a, a perception that's already happening in the, in the moment. And I want to be honest here. You don't blame the cover culture, you blame the individual who decides to stay there long enough. Every Tongan, every Pacific Island male understands their responsibilities to fulfill at home before leaving their place to enter cover circle. And if the, if the kava drinkers know that they haven't fulfilled the obligations and responsibilities at home, we will tell them to go home and carry out before coming into the circle and enjoying a good time. And that's something that, um, um, that I'll be honest and, and for, and I think it's time now for um, services, for social services and health providers to engage with kava researchers and kava drinkers and how we can move forward in addressing this issue um, and you know, saving us time later, and, and constantly running kava workshops and kava awareness and all that kind of stuff, which for me is a beauty because I can continue drinking kava. <laughs> Thank you, Edmund. Hey, um, Monique's got a question here around uh, ethics approval processes and the requirements of consent forms and participant information sheets, and 
Her question is, do you feel that sometimes these work against doing research in culturally safe ways with Pacific communities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a good paper out there by um, Dr. Timote Violetti, um, where he published in the Stellanoa Research Methodology paper in 2006, and I strongly recommend that you read that because he talks about, and as, we, as me and, and, and Annalise have talked about, and Kim's mentioned as well, the importance of value-based frameworks. So instead of going into looking at, at a Western structure of carrying our research, going with the values and address it that way uh, and make it more strength-based instead of um, um, going in with all these ethical questions from a Western institution that you have to address to. Um, and so I strongly re uh, re recommend that you read um, Dr. Timote Violetti's 2006 paper on Dalano Research Methodologies, where he's highlighted various values that you can use in preparation and that when before going into data connection. I think one of the raises kind of a, a big kind of, I don't know whether it's an elephant in the room, but a lot of, um, I guess there's a few countries that are sending aid into Pacific countries and then wanting evaluation about the value of the programs and where that aid's going. And a lot of those researchers aren't Pacific peoples. Um, I guess there's two things there. One is building up a, um, maybe more Pacifica researchers, but the other side to it is around the ethical considerations of non-Indigenous peoples doing that sort of work with Indigenous peoples, both here and overseas, actually. Sorry, it happens here too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's about time that we, that we start to address um, these issues from a, from a cultural-based and understanding. And Elise, would you like to comment on that? Yes, um, so my experience in research, I've always come from the community engagement. So, you know, not doing research for research sake or not having research done to you because we've, we've had so much of that in our Pacific communities. And I want to go back to talking about the VA, the sacred space, the relational space, because often that bit has not taken place at all. Now that's just like suicide really. I, you know, sometimes I just think, oh yeah, watch the natural death, go on, go, go ahead. It's not safe for you to do that. You wouldn't go anywhere else to ask for knowledge or data gathering if you haven't established a relationship first. But preceding that, I think being really clear about what's the purpose, what is it that you're wanting to achieve? Has that been led by the community, by Pacific people in giving authenticity and ownership of the narrative? Who holds the pen here? And, and coming from that angle. So that's that's been my experience, but also lessons learned where research hasn't been done really well. Uh, all, all the paperwork and ethics aside, there hasn't been a relationship, an authentic, well-intentioned, meaningful relationship in, in the engagement space, the relational space, the bar between community and researchers and evaluators. And that takes time. And, and, and so that's probably my top tip around the engagement. Talanoa, absolutely. If you understand Talanoa, if Talanoa is part of your cultural context and epistemology, your knowledge base, you don't need to talk about what Talanoa is because you understand it. But I think as an individual, whether you're Pacific or not, you know, possibly the best advice I can always give is to take the time to get to know what do you know and what don't you know? What are you trying to achieve? But really focus in on those relationships, being led by the values, but also making sure that you're not making assumptions about what those values are as well and being respectful. Um, and sometimes that just means you're there to listen and not talk. You know, that's, that's about Dalanoi as well and understanding the respect that's required in, in that sacred space, that relational space. Because if you don't have the relationship, you don't get permission to enter. You may be in there, but you may not recognize or not read the environment that they haven't actually given you permission. And, and those are critical. Mm. Go even, sorry. In regards to evaluation, uh, for those who are tuning in, we are in need for more Pacific evaluators. We have a truckload of Pacific researchers but we know for sure that we need more in the evaluation space. So if you're keen, um, let us know and we can I can refer you to the right people um, involved in, in the evaluation space um, and possibly try to set up 
um, or my long-term goal is to set up a, a Pacific Evaluation Service to, to fit uh, and work alongside not just Pacific providers, but also our government departments who are constantly evaluating their initiatives, their programs. So we need more of our Pacific world views, our voices, our methodologies, our frameworks involved in all, in all these evaluation services. Kia ora Edmund. Um, I guess I just wanted to reflect on your comment before Annalise around the whole notion of permission by omission, where people don't say yes, but they don't say no. So people take that as a yes, yes, that's fine. Everything's fine. And I think sometimes perhaps um, do, it might be a cultural, hmm, I don't know, what, what would you call that? <laughs> a, uh, a misunderstanding of culture because people aren't necessarily saying I don't like you, I don't like this, go away <laughs> yeah. I, the word that I use is nuances so there's often things that you don't know, you don't know what you're looking at, you don't understand the behaviour or the body language You know, we're really good at it in the Cook Islands where we just smile but there's the assassin happening at the same time <laughs> so I, th I think it's yeah taking the time at the beginning to really understand the values um, and, and the approach that's required and not making an assumption about what, what that should be before you enter. And sometimes it's not even about you being present. So, you know, do research without being present. <laughs> <laughs> that might have to be a thing. You know, for me as a younger person going into a space with my elders or with other key people of status, Knowing, knowing the role um, and, and understanding the environment that you go into. You know, again, that these things are fundamental in the engagement, regardless of where it is. You need to know. You need to know what you don't know. Um, one of the things that I've seen in, in order to kind of address some of the ethics concerns has been rather than simply giving a nod to the ethics in your paperwork at the beginning of a project, to actually have uh, groups of elders or tipuna or well you know komata or elders sitting alongside you know keeping that cultural practice um, right is that something that um, tends to happen across Pacifica research as well? Yeah absolutely um, and it's also um, yeah. recommended by a lot of ethics committees uh, ethic committees um, regarding in the importance of having an advisory group um, and particularly for higher research uh, and, and more sensitive issues. Uh, and so these, these, yeah, there's a lot of talks regarding that as well. So, but at the same time, as a, as a researcher, uh, a Pacific researcher, I think it's important that you, if you ground yourself enough with uh, a lot of cultural knowledge, then you should be safe um, because that takes a lot of time in organizing an advisory group. In fact, I was, for my PhD research, I was asked whether I needed a Pacific committee. Um, and I said to them, no, because I can go to my Pacific communities at any time, at any place, um, to for their knowledge. Um, and so, um, you know, it doesn't require a, a set group of people. You can, you can go to their communities. In fact, we need to start appreciating our own families, um, particularly our grandmothers, our grandparents, um, our, our, our own parents, and, and, and holding knowledge as well that we need to start utilising in, in some of research spaces. Um, I guess I'm, I just want to leave with one other thought is that um, the notion of people coming in and doing design and co-design is very hot at the moment and uh, it's almost taken the place of uh, research and evaluation to some extent in the design of programs, policies and things like that. Have you got any thoughts around uh, I guess specific views towards that whole design co-design um, process because often it's quite it's come out of a corporate product production kind of frame and it seeks input but it doesn't necessarily transfer ownership and power of the process or the or what's being done so you know have there been any examples I guess of good uh, good design work that you've seen go on and also what are the what are some of the pitfalls there I've, um, I've heard that the, the term co-design fly around for a lot of reasons um, but it's you know, it's very interesting, particularly around the notion of IP or intellectual property. Um, and then who really, you know, who really owns the knowledge within the co-design partnership. And we've seen, let's be honest, we know of Māori Pacific um, communities and providers who uh, they've co-designed with a number, 
a number of departments or number of, of, of organizations and their knowledge is not either credited or um, they no longer own it because it's of someone else. And this whole thing with an MOU is signed and all that kind of stuff, so you can't take it away from us. Um, we as Pacific peoples need to start looking at our own ways of doing things and co-designing with our own uh, families and communities uh, and ensuring that the knowledge is not lost um, and is not transferred. And, and we know for sure that we, when IP has gone into various co-design projects, it can be lost in translation, it can be misinterpreted in a number of ways. So, and I think moving forward, um, you know, it's, it's critical that we need to start looking at ways of how do we ensure that our IP is not lost in, in translation in a lot of the co-design projects, uh, particularly with government departments. Thank you, Edmund. And Lisa, um, any final comments, please? Just to summarise, I guess, what I what I found online, but I thought really summarised what Edmund has been talking about around the Carver Bowl. Um, but also just in general around Pacific research, defining it, understanding it. And this infographic, hopefully you can all see that, gives nine reasons why Pacific research is important. And that, to me, that really resonated with what I've been trying to articulate over the last 20 years of being someone who's been a recipient mm -hmm. of research, researchers, evaluators, but very much coming from, from the experience of a community person um, and they, these are the nine reasons so you know I'll read them out just in case but I that this summarizes what I think would be really important as you know this webinar acknowledging what Dr Edmund has said I wish we were around the carver bowl discussing this having this talanoa because the richness we've only just started um, you know so number one that it recenters indigenous knowledge systems Number two, reaffirms indigenous worldviews. Three, returns agency. And I speak, speak about returning agency to community. Um, four, rejects racism. So no longer perpetuating a perspective or an interpretation of the Western world, but really given authenticity and challenging the racism that exists within the knowledge collection and perception of how that knowledge is used. Um, five reconfigures research paradigms. So I've loved hearing about Kakala, the Va, um, Tivaivai. You know, they, there's so much to celebrate around our own research paradigms and taking leadership in that. Reclaiming our space. So I've had a lot of conversation with our Pacific uh, leaders who say, are we still reclaiming or are we claiming? Well, regardless of where you sit on that continuum of knowledge gathering, you know, you're either going to be reclaiming or claiming or taking the lead in that. And I think we can really celebrate with our Pacific research and researchers. Seven, recognizing our roots and our routes, however you want to um, pronounce that. Our academic rigor and replenishing our capacity. So again, I go back to speaking with my hat on as a kaitiaki, a board member of community research, that when we started this, we wanted to give visibility to Pacific research and evaluation, but really give the ownership of the pen back to our Pacific people to say, you define what this is, you define what this means, you tell us who gives authority for this knowledge. And you tell us how this should happen and, and how it should be used. But also that we need to build the capacity as Edmund has, has already signaled. We need more research, Pacific researchers, evaluators and community knowledge being brought into the space and bringing it together in an independent platform. Uh, that's my summary. That's my nine reasons. They're not my nine reasons, but happy to share this from our um, Pacific academics who have brought this infographic together. Kia ora, um, Annalise. Um, just letting all our viewers know that we will post these uh, resources on our website. I'm hoping that you're happy to share that and uh, Edmund will need to catch up afterwards so I can write down all the papers you referenced and we can dig them out and share them with our viewers as well. So Ed, over to you. Have you got a last a last for card or for everyone, please? Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in from your various uh, workplaces, workstations. Um, work cars and work homes, uh, wherever you are, thank you for tuning in. Um, 
and, and, and tuning into this very important Dalam Noah. I guess for me, um, I, I'm not as articulate as Annalise, but uh, I, I, I tend to use um, some things that help motivate me to do things. Uh, and that is a quote that I usually say all the time. So if you heard me before say this, you're going to hear it again. By Benjamin Disraeli, we once said, the greatest good you can do for another is not to share your riches, but to reveal to them their own. As researchers, as fathers, as mothers, as parents, as community leaders, um, we need to continue to unpack the hidden riches within our younger generation to come. Um, and continuing to unpack and reveal the, the riches um, that God has blessed our people with within our communities that we const constantly serve on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you like it or not. So with that, I uh, thank you again, Kim and Elise, Community Research, for the opportunity. Um, and if you are keen to engage um, uh, with myself uh, in regards to addressing how do we how do we address specific research from a community lens? Feel free to um, email me and we'll continue the data not around the Kava Bowl as well. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora korua, uh, he mihi mahana kia korua mō tēnei wā. Um, we encourage you to post any kind of other burning questions uh, on our Community Research Facebook page. Um, and hopefully they'll have a chance, our, our presenters today, Annalise and Ed will have a chance to get on to respond. We'll also post our resources and the references up there too. I'd like to mahi to both Annalise and Dr. Edmund Fehoko for sharing their wero, their whakaro and their inspiration with us today. Um, uh, what was I going to say next? Oh, so please join our Community Research Facebook page. Um, again, subscribe to our email by, um, uh, our monthly e-news by emailing communications at communityresearch.org.nz. Thank you to everybody who's been posting such fantastic feedback and great questions today. We have a couple of webinars in December. One is on the 7th with Dr. Daniel Hernandez, who I saw was a participant today. And his session is going to be about exploring identity and exploration of how we learn, express, negotiate, and create our identities and how this is relevant to our culture, society, politics and well-being. And on the 16th of November, continuing the theme of Indigenous research ethics, we have a couple of scholar activists, so one of them is Antja Decker and Juan Todi. So uh, join our Facebook page to keep up to date with that. So thank you all again. There will be a video copy of our webinar with Annalise and Edmund and it will be uploaded later this week and you can share that with colleagues. We encourage you to. Um, thank you again all for your time today. Modi ora. The Community Research website offers a hub for good community research and researchers. It's the place for the public to find and share evidence about effective community practices. The website collects research and evidence and organises these so that they can be easily accessed and used by other groups. You can access this research and browse by category, by a list of quick link topics or by searching for something specific. All of the research is free to download. The Community Research site is all about excellence and effective practices. You can view recordings of past webinars and find out about future ones. The webinars share evidence about what's working in the community sector. Published by Community Research in 2007, the Code of Practice provides the standards and guidelines for doing research. It's the place to start if you're thinking of undertaking research with or in a community or iwi. As well as the collection of research, we keep a register of experienced researchers who are skilled at working with iwi and communities. To find a researcher who can help you, we have a filter system which allows you to find people based on location, qualification, ethnic group and area of expertise. The Community Research website is a unique resource for the community sector to use and share. It matters because communities who learn well will do well. It matters because it evidences what's working for us. For researchers and community people alike, we've made it as easy as possible to share your research on our website. Kowa e whakama. Uploading material is quick and simple. Save your work as a PDF and head over to Share Research. Answer a few questions that help us tag and organize the research so it's easy for people to find. If you're a researcher and skilled at working with communities, you can add your details to the directory of researchers so that you can be found. Community research keeps you updated and informed. This helps make you more effective. 
If you want to stay updated about the latest research, informed about new resources and our upcoming webinars, head over to sign up for our e-news on the homepage. Community research is a rich resource built for and by the community. For it to reach maximum potential, we rely on you to contribute, participate and support the resource to grow and thrive. Mā te kotahitanga e ora ai tātou.